Thank you. Can you see? Well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for toughing out the day, and you all deserve a, a, a big applause for your endurance and your uh, uh, stamina. Well, the Sino-U.S. relationship is the most important bilateral relationship in the world, a bedrock of global prosperity that impacts the well-being of billions of people around the world. Since the signing of the Shanghai Communique 44 years ago, China and the United States have proclaimed on numerous occasions a shared commitment to a positive and cooperative relationship. The two countries' leaders have often spoken of their commitment to developing a stable and prosperous relationship, and both sides have worked closely to implement one that is based on mutual trust, respect, and win-win cooperation. Nevertheless, the events of 2015 have raised concerns about the health of the Sino-U.S. relationship. We have seen tension, among other things, over cybersecurity, the remilitarization of Japan, and the South China Sea. The Obama administration is pursuing a pivot to, China, to Asia and has sent its warships through waters China claims as its own. It is no secret that some people in each country view the other often through a lens of suspicion and distrust. China and the United States, after all, do have fundamental differences. The two countries subscribe to different ideologies and descend from very different cultural, moral, and religious traditions. These differences together with concern for recent events, seem to provide evidence to analysts and scholars who believe that China and the United States are headed towards the Thucydides trap, a theory which presupposes inevitable conflict between existing and ascending major powers. But this is an incomplete and simplistic picture of the Sino-US relationship. First, we should acknowledge that despite the complex nature and geopolitical and cultural variety of the Asia-Pacific, peace is and has been prevailing. Compared to much of the rest of the world, there is a notable absence of active warfare in the region. Trade and cooperative projects are extensive in the region as well as between China and the United States. Second, we should recognize that China and the United States maintain a communicative relationship. Both Beijing and Washington have realized that engagement is important. The importance of this cannot be underscored. The two sides are talking to each other often and regularly. Our presidents are meeting one another more than once a year, and they will be meeting again very soon this year in a month or two. Third. There are numerous areas of agreement and cooperation. China and the United States share common foes, challenges, predicaments, and needs. Terrorism, the environment, the economy, energy, global stability, these are among the many areas that present opportunities for corporations. Some of these opportunities are already being pursued. China and the United States have, for example, been leading global efforts to combat climate change. At their meeting in September, President Xi and President Obama found consensus on cybersecurity, nuclear security, peacekeeping, and reconstruction and economic development in Afghanistan. We ourselves have discussed some of these opportunities today, identifying further areas of potential cooperation in global security, cybersecurity, and counterterrorism, as well as potential ways to resolve disputes in the Western Pacific. There are certainly many more ways and issues areas where China and the United States can cultivate a more unified and harmonious relationship. Ladies and gentlemen, Building a meaningful major country relationship requires constant communication, cooperation, and partnership. This can only be brought about through goodwill and built upon a foundation of mutual trust and respect. 
But how do we go from communicating to understanding, and from understanding to achieving mutual trust and respect? Beijing and Washington have realized the importance of communication. They have established more than 60 regular government-to-government -government dialogues between agencies in the two countries every year. But this alone is not enough. As one observer wittily stated, between the U.S. and the China, there have been numerous meetings and many engagements of dialogue, but there remains too little understanding, scarce empathy, dwindling mutual trust and respect, a deficit of goodwill, and practically no cooperation. The question then is, what, is, what has been missing? Why has trust been slow, so slow to develop? It was my previous capacity as the Secretary for Home Affairs of the Hong Kong government that I first came to appreciate the importance of mutual trust and respect in conflict management and resolution. My experience in this position revealed that there are three pillars to developing trust and respect. The first pillar is dialogue, the second is human touch, and the third is common experience. Dialogue, the first pillar, is indispensable in mitigating and resolving conflicts. Dialogue is essential in making sure that the parties involved understand one another's experiences, needs, and difficulties. Dialogue is the gateway to understanding. China, as a modest nation which has not been familiar with expressing herself openly in the past, can improve on this front. Perhaps we need to do more self-reflection, to actively engage with others in dialogues, to let ourselves be understood and be able to tell a China story in ways that are easily received and understood. But dialogue requires more than meeting in the same place. It requires listening and caring for what the other side has to say. This underscores why the second pillar is human touch. A relationship can only be successful if it is personalized. Trust and respect require shifting how one perceives the other. Understanding with empathy can place us in the other's shoes and help us realize why and how the other side acted in the way they did and took the decisions it made. This shift requires human qualities like empathy and genuine interaction. It cannot be brought forward merely by official reports and declarations. This is why it is essential to provide venues for personal relationships among the parties involved, in our case, government officials, military officers, and stakeholders. President Xi and Obama's meeting at the Annenberg Retreat held in Sunnyland, California in 2013 is an excellent example. The third pillar is common experience, which is the basis for true and lasting friendship. Indeed, one of the ways, and perhaps the best way, to alleviate international tensions and resolve political conflicts is for the parties to enter into joint projects and business ventures with one another. People should be busy making money together instead of wars, learning from each other and collaborating to make the world a more prosperous place for all people. By working together on common courses and thereby developing common experiences, China and the United States can grow together as a nation and as peoples, and in time, embrace a common destiny. From here on, Sino-U.S. relations can evolve in one of two ways. One is through geopolitics of a unipolar system built on asymmetric military relations and involving tug of wars on issues pertaining national interests, sovereignty, and territorial rights. It is a model of zero-sum game. The other is through geoeconomic approach of a multipolar system which provides both countries with ample opportunities for partnerships, business ventures, and cooperative and collaborative projects of all kinds. This multifaceted, multidimensional model, which is the core of the third pillar of common experience, creates stability, harmony, and peace. It is a model from which everyone stands to benefit with win-win outcomes for all. 
The three pillars of dialogue, human touch, and common experience are fundamental to improving mutual trust and respect between the two countries. And we can all, can all do more to strengthen these pillars. Every one of us, I believe, young and old, rich and poor, Chinese American, from, from the Forbidden City to the White House, has a role to play in building a more harmonious relationship between China and the United States. This is why the China Energy Fund Committee has organized the Sino-U.S. Colloquium, which meets for the ninth time in its fifth consecutive years. Through these colloquiums, CEFC, or China Energy Fund Committee, has been working to strengthen the three pillars of mutual trust and respect. Our commitment to this cause demonstrates our desire to facilitate the building of a new type of relationship between our nations and peoples. We hope that our effort will inspire others to accomplish the same. Ladies and gentlemen, we are truly living in historic times, and this opportunity to build new confidence and trust is one of the greatest challenges facing the Sino-US relationship. The way ahead will not be easy and we cannot underestimate the difficulties that lay ahead. The issues are numerous and formidable, and the complexities extensive and challenging. But I am confident that our two peoples and their leaders will have the wisdom and courage to truly grasp this moment and begin to build a better world in the years ahead. On this note, as this is the year of the American people will elect the president, from the discussion we had today, we would like to tender three pieces of suggestion to the American presidential candidate for their consideration. First, China and the United States are friends. We have been friends in the past, and we will be friends in the, in the future. We may at times be friendly competitors, but we are not and will not be enemies. Second, China and the United States have much in common, and more in common than indifference. We must work together on what we have in common and manage our differences. Third, if we do so, if China and the United States work together, the whole world will benefit. If we do not, the whole world will suffer. Ladies and gentlemen, China and the United States have been friends for 40 years. We are friends today and we will be friends for a long time to come. We share common challenges, common predicaments, and common needs. But most importantly, we face and behold a common destiny, a destiny that presents itself as a mission to redefine our mutual values, signifying the awakening of a modern humanity, and which, we hope, will ultimately lead to a renaissance of a modern times. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming today, and I wish you a very pleasant journey home. See you all next year, same time, same place. Goodbye. Thank you.